final production of our 2017-2018 season. We're so glad that you're here. We hope you have a great time tonight. Um, how many of you have been coming to our shows all season? Excellent. Wonderful. Good. How many of you know we have a Facebook page and that you can like our Facebook page? Good. Uh, we are about to announce our 2018-2019 season. Uh, we'll be announcing it actually a week from today. So if you liked what you've seen this year, I really, really encourage you to come back next year uh, and, and watch our shows as well. It's a very exciting season and we're looking forward to it. So the best way to find out about that information and be in the know is to like our Facebook page and follow us. We really appreciate our followers. Uh, tonight, what you're seeing is actually a culmination of the theater management class. These are junior and senior theater majors and minors that are learning how to produce theater within the non-for-profit model. And what they've done is they have created the company, which you'll notice on your programs, is Symposium Theater Company. They are responsible for the creation of this company. They've come up with their mission statement and their core values and have been working all semester in creating, producing, directing, designing, acting, uh, selecting the shows that you'll be seeing. So they've done it all. They're also responsible for the program that is in their hands. So it doesn't say Huntington University Theater Company, but it is under the umbrella of what we do here. So I'm very proud of these students, and I hope you are as well as you look at the work and see that uh, and recognize that it's all student-led and student-created. So that's a pretty special thing. Uh, there are two intermissions in between the three one acts this evening. They're very short, five minutes each. The running time of the show is just shy of two hours. Um, and if you'll just please take this opportunity to turn off your cell phones, because it's a very small space where you can hear things even when they vibrate. So if you'll turn them completely off, we would appreciate it very much. All right, thank you again for coming. We hope to see you next year and enjoy the one act festival. Have a good night. I came for his, uh, 
I came to ask for the hand of your daughter, Natasha. Oh, mama, I do love my savior. I don't think I got that last part. I came to ask for the hand of your daughter, Natasha.
Uh, it's awful cold in here. Uh, so, so what did you come for then? Hmm? Hmm? Uh, I'll try to make this brief. Uh, now, Natasha, you and I have known each other for quite some time, ever since we were children. Uh, I've always had the great pleasure of knowing your entire family and my poor dead aunt and her husband. And as you know, I inherited my land from them. They always had the greatest respect for your father and your poor dead mother. <laughs> uh, uh, besides, um, the low mobs and the Vasilevichs, ah, we're always on friendly terms. It's almost like we were related. <laughs> um, besides, well, you already know this. And besides, uh, my land and yours are right next door to each other. Uh, take my metal land, for instance. It lies right alongside of your birch grove. Oh, yeah. OK, excuse me. I don't mean to interrupt you, but I think you said my metal land. Uh, are you saying that metal land belongs to you? Yes, as a matter of fact, I am. Well, I never. Meadowland belongs to us, not you. No, no, Natasha. Meadowland is mine. Well, that's the first time I've heard of it. Since when is it yours? What do you mean, since when? I'm talking about, about the little pasture they call Meadowland. The one that makes a wedge between your birch grove yes. and birch swamp. Yes, I know the one that you mean, but it's ours. No, Natasha, I, I think you're making a mistake. That field belongs to me. Oh, Ivan, do you realize what you're saying? And just how long has it belonged to you? Then? What do you mean, how long? As far as I know, it's always been mine. Excuse me, I am just certain now, that. Natasha, it's all very clearly marked on those deeds. Oh. Now, there was some argument about it back a ways, but nowadays everybody knows that that field belongs to me. So there's no use arguing about it. You see, what happened was my aunt's grandmother let your grandfather's tenants use that field for an indefinite amount of time in exchange for them making bricks for her. Now, your grandfather's people, they used that land for about 40 years and they started to think it was theirs, but it turns out that the real situation was... My grandfather and my great-grandfather, they both always said that our land went as far back as Bird Swamp, which means the Meadowland belongs to us. So, so what's the point of arguing about it? Hmm? I think that you are just being rude. I can show you the papers, Natasha Vasilovich. Oh, oh! I see. I get it. Yeah. This is all just some big joke. You're just pulling my leg, that, isn't it? Because well, we have owned that land for going on 300 years now, and all of a sudden you say that it doesn't belong to us? No. Oh, well, I would blow off. I just can't believe that you said that. And believe me, I don't care one bit about the field. It's only 12 acres. It's not worth 300 rubles even, but that's not the point. The injustice of it that hurts, and and I don't care what anyone says. That that kind of injustice, I can't stop with. But you weren't listening to what I was saying. <laughs> Please. <laughs> As I was trying very politely to point out to you, my grand, your grandfather's tenants had used that field for an indefinite amount of time in exchange to make bricks for my aunt's grandmother and my aunt's grandmother. She was just trying to be nice. Grandfather, grandfather, father. What difference does it make? Mm, that field belongs to us. No, that field is mine. That field belongs to us. And you can go on and on about your grandmother until you're blue in the face. You wear 15 fancy vests, and it still belongs to us. It is ours. 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 And I don't want anything that belongs to you, but I do want to keep it my own. Thank you very much. Natasha Vasilevich, I don't care about that field either. I don't need that field. It's the principle of the thing that I'm talking about. If you want that field so bad, you can have it. I'll give it to you. Oh, if there's any giving to be done, I will I will be doing it. That field belongs to me. <laughs> okay, I have never gone through anything this crazy in all my life. Up until recently, I have thought of you as a good neighbor, a real friend, and now all of a sudden you're treating us like gypsies. You will give me my own field. Well, excuse me, but that is a pretty unneighborly thing to do, and in fact, in my opinion, it is downright insulting. So, in your opinion, I'm some kind of claim jumper then. <laughs> oh, whoops, lady. I've never tried to take anybody else's land, and I'm not going to let anyone try to tell me that I did either. Not even you. Meadowland is mine. It's ours. It's mine. It's ours. And I will prove it to you. I'll send my mowers out there today. Yo, what? I said I will send my mowers out there today, and they will hate that field flat. Oh, you do, and I will break their necks. <laughs> That field belongs to me, you understand? It's mine! Shout, you can scream and carry on all you want in your own house, but as long as you are in mine, try to behave like a gentleman. I 
tell you is I didn't have these murmurs, these awful pains, oh, these veins throbbing in my temples. I wouldn't be speaking like this. Meadowland is mine! 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 mine. 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 Oh, yeah. Well, 
are you lying for? You ought to be getting ready to put your old guesser out of his misery, and here you are preparing the semester. Go after, excuse me. I can't carry on with this conversation any longer. I'm having a heartburn. <laughs> well, no, no, this just goes to prove what I have always known to be fact. The hunters who talk the most know the least. Will you just please do me a favor and shut up? Get a doctor! Oh, what's going on? Get a doctor! What's, what's going on? He's dead! 
there so long I killed myself. Now that's it. Give me a knife. Bring me a gun. No, no, no. Looks like he's gonna make it. Here, boy, drink this. That's the way. Where am I? Oh, I see the spots. It's all so fuzzy. Where am I? Just get out of here as soon as you can. She says yes. She says yes and everything. I give you both my blessing. Only please, leave me in peace. How? Uh, who? She says yes, all right. Now kiss her and get the tarnation out of here. Oh, I guess, yes, I say yes. Oh, uh, who? Now give him a kiss. Uh, oh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's very nice. <laughs> Excuse me, but what's going on here? I, oh, I remember now my heart and, and these, these spots. And I'm so happy, Natasha. I, my legs still paralyzed. I, I'm very happy too. Oh, guess way off my shoulders. It's all the same. You can't admit it now, can't you? Messer is better than Guesser. He's worse. Well, he's now we live happily ever after. Bring in the champagne. He's worse. He's worse. Oh, my champagne! Bring in the Except to say, like, you know, uh, give me a beer, 
what time does the future go on? Or where's the time? Or hey, keep your hands to yourself, buddy. You know, stuff like that. I must say I do. But every once in a while, I like to talk to somebody, like really talk to them. It's still all about it. And am I your guinea pig for today? On a sun drenched Sunday afternoon like this, who better than a nice married man with a wife, two daughters, and a dog? No. <laughs> two dogs. No dog, shame, I would have taken you for an animal, man. Cats? Cats! No, sir, that couldn't have been your idea. No, your wife and your daughters. Is there anything else I should know about? Parakeets. There are two parakeets. One for each of my daughters. They keep them in their room in cages. They don't carry disease, do they? The, the birds. Uh, no, <laughs> Shame, you could have let them loose in the house and the cats could have beaten them and they'd die again. <laughs> uh, well, what do you do to support your enormous household? I, uh, uh, I'm an executive publisher at uh, a small publishing firm. Right. We publish textbooks. That sounds very nice. How much do you make? Okay, now look here. <laughs> Come on. Uh, I make around two hundred thousand a year, but I, I don't carry around more than forty dollars at a time in case you're a uh, holdup man. <laughs> Where do you live? <laughs> Come on, I'm not gonna rob you. I'm not gonna kidnap your cats and parakeets or your two daughters. I live between Lincoln and Third Avenue on 74th Street. What? That wasn't so hard, was it? <laughs> I'm sorry. It's just you ask a lot of questions, and normally I'm reticent. Why do you just stand there? I'll walk around in a little while. Maybe later I'll sit down. Say. What's the dividing line between the upper middle middle class and the lower upper middle class? Oh, my good sir. Don't. My good sir. Me. Was that being patronizing? Uh, I'm, I'm sorry. You see, it's just, I'm not good at expressing myself. But I, I'm in publishing, not writing. <laughs> so be it. You know, the truth of it was I was being patronizing. Oh, no, 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 you don't have to say that. All right, who's your favorite writer? Go to Land City UK. Well, those, both those writers are fine in their own right, but uh, Baudelaire is by far the finer of the two. You see, Stephen King has his place, but in our uh, national... Skip it. Oh, sorry? You know what I did before I went to the zoo today? I walked up Fifth Avenue from Washington Square, all the way up. Oh, you live in Greenwich Village. No. No, I took the subway down to the village so I could walk up Fifth Avenue. Yeah, it's a thing that a person has to do sometimes. Sometimes a person has to walk a very long distance out of the way to come back to a short distance directly. Oh, I, I live in Greenwich Village. Well, what were you trying to do? Make sense out of things? Ah, bring order in the whole pigeonhole thing? <coughs> That's easy. I'll just talk to stuff. I live in a four story brownstone living apartment between the west side of New York City, between Columbus Avenue and Central Park West. I live in the top rear floor. Rear west. It's a laughably small room. One of the walls is made out of fever board. Now, on the other side of this fever board is a black queen. This black queen always keeps his door open. Well, not always, but always when he's plucking his eyebrows, which he does with Buddhist concentration. Now, the black queen has rotten teeth, which is red. The black queen also has a Japanese kimono, which is also pretty red. He likes to wear his kimono to and from the john in the hall, which is frequent. I mean to say, he goes to the bathroom a lot. Now, the black queen doesn't bother him. He doesn't bring in people or whatever. All he does is pluck his eyebrow, wear his kimono, and go to and from the jump. Now, the two front rooms across from me, they're a little bit bigger, but they're still pretty small. And one of them is a Puerto Rican family. A husband, a wife, some kids, I don't know how many. And in the other one, well, somebody lives there. I don't really know who. I've, I've never seen them. Never. Never ever. Why do you live there? I don't know. It doesn't sound like a very nice place where you live. No, it's not an apartment in the East 70s, but then again, I don't have a wife, two kids, two cats, or two parents. What I do have is toilet articles, a few clothes, a, a hot plate that I'm not supposed to have, a can opener, one that works with a key, you know, um, a fork. A knife, two spoons, and one small, one large, a cup, a drinking glass, three saucers, and three plates, eight or nine books, two picture frames, 
both empty, a pack of pornographic playing cards, a regular deck, and an old Western Union typewriter that prints nothing but capital letters, and a strong box without a lock. In it, rocks, which weigh down on letters. Please, letters. Please, why don't you do this? And please, why don't you do that, letters? And when letters too. When will you write? When will you come? When? These are from more recent view. About those two picture frames. Well, I don't see why they need any explanation at all. Isn't it obvious? Not a picture is of anyone to put in there. Well, your parents, perhaps? Uh, a girlfriend? Uh, you are a very sweet man and possessed of a truly enviable innocence. But good old mom and good old pop are dead. You know? Yeah, no, I'm beat up about it too. It's just, you know, I don't see how I can see them all neat frames, or, or rather to be pointed. Good old mom walked out of good old pop when I was ten and a half years old. She took, uh, she took an adulterous turn to the southern states, a journey of a year's duration, and her most constant companion, among others, among many others, Mr. Barley Corn. Or at least that's what good old pop told me when he went down and came back, brought her body back up north. We learned the news just between Christmas and New Year's. You see, that my good old mom had departed with the ghost in some dump in Alabama. Well, at any rate, good old Pop celebrated the New Year's for an even two weeks and then slapped in front of a somewhat moving city omnibus, which sort of cleaned things out family-wise. Oh, my. Oh, my. Oh, you're what? At any rate, that was a long time ago, and I don't really have any feelings about it that I care to admit to myself. But you can see, rather, my good old mom and good old pop are frameless. What's your name? Your first name? Oh, uh, I'm Peter. I forgot to ask. I'm Jerry. Hello, Jerry. Now, what's the point of having a girl's picture in the picture frame? I had two of them, remember? And besides, I don't have been able to see the pretty little ladies once, and most of them wouldn't be caught dead in a room with a camera. It's odd. I wonder if it's sad. The girls? No. That I've only been able to have sex with them once. Or how would you put it? No. I've only been able to make love with someone once. Once. That's it. Actually, no. When I was 15, I was an H O M O S E X U A L. I was queer. 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 With bells ringing, banners stacking in the wind. For those 11 and a half days, I met at least twice a day with the park superintendent's son, a Greek boy who had the same birthday as mine, except I think he was a year older. I was very much in love. Maybe just with sex. <laughs> but that was the chance of a very special hotel. And now, ooh, now do I love the pretty little ladies. I do, really, for about an hour. <laughs> <laughs> it seems perfectly simple to me. You just haven't met them. Look. You aren't about to tell me to get married and have a couple of parakeets, are you? <laughs> Forget the parakeets. Stay single if you want to. It's no okay. business of mine. I didn't start this conversation. All right. But I'm sorry. You're not angry? No, I'm not angry. Good. Funny you asked about the picture frames. I thought you would have asked about the pornographic playing cards. Oh, I've seen those cards. That's not my point. You know, maybe, maybe you had a pack with your friends that you shared around, or maybe you had a whole deck for yourself. Well, I guess a lot of us had those. And you got rid of them <laughs> before you got married? Well, look, I didn't need a pack like that once I got married. No? I thought I would feel comfortable talking about this. <laughs> <laughs> no. You know, I wasn't trying to plug into your post adolescent sexual life in hard times. Rather, I figured you'd like to hear about what happened at the zoo. Oh, yes, the zoo. <laughs> I'll tell you that, but first let me some tell you some things, or some other things, you know. I've already told you about the four story rooming house. You know, I think the rooms get better as you go down on the second or third floor. I don't really know, I don't know anybody on the second or third floor. You know what I do? You know what I do? I, because on the third floor, I know there's this girl, because I always hear her crying. All the time, whenever I go past her room, whenever I come in or come out, I always hear her crying behind her door, muffled. But determined, very determined indeed. Anyway, the one I'm getting to, and it's all about the dog, is the landlady. Now, I don't like to use words that are too harsh in describing people, but this landlady is a fat, ugly, mean, stupid, pedantic, unwashed, drunken bag of garbage. And you might have known it. I seldom use profanity, so I might not describe her as well as I like. 
You describe her vividly. Thank you. Anyway, she has a dog. She, the dog, is the gatekeepers to my dwelling. Landlady's mad at her. You know, she likes to spy around the corner to make sure I don't bring in things or people. And after she's had her mid-afternoon pint of lemon-flavored gin, she'll stop me in the hall. Grab me by my coat or my arm and push me into a corner, push her body up next to me so she can talk to me. The smell of her body, her breath, unimaginable. And somewhere, somewhere in that brain of hers, a pea-sized organ developed just enough to let her eat, sleep, and admit that she is some foul sexual parody. And I, Peter, am the object of her sweaty lust. That's disgusting. That's horrible. Yeah, I found a way to keep her off. Whenever she pushes into me, whenever she pushes me into the corner, mumbles about her room and how we should go back in there, I merely said, but love wasn't yesterday enough and the day before. She puzzles, makes little slits in her eyes, and at this moment, Peter, I think I might be doing some good in that tormented household. She sways, giggles and groans and relives and believes what never happened. Then she motions to a black dog of hers, goes back into her room, and I am safe until the next meeting. I find it hard to believe that people such as that really are. And such is for reading about, isn't it? Yes. In fact, it's better left to fiction. You're right, Peter. I've been meaning to tell you about the dog, and I shall now. Oh, yes, the dog. Well, <laughs> don't go. You're not thinking of going, are you? No. Go. Yes. You know what happens after I tell you about the dog? Then, Peter. Tell you what happened at the zoo. Huh. You're full of stories, aren't you? You don't have to listen. You know, no one's keeping you here, remember that. Keep that in your mind. I know that. You do? Good. All right. The story of Jerry and the dog. What I'm about to tell you has a lot to do with how a person has to go a very long distance out of the way to come back to a short distance correctly. Or at least I think it has something to do with that. <laughs> I don't know. Huh? It's why I went to the zoo today and why I walked north. No, I really grab it. <clears throat> All right, the dog. The dog, as I've been telling you, is a black monster of a beast. An oversized head, tiny, tiny ears, eyes, bloodshot, neck and me. A body, you can see the ribs through the skin. The monster is black. All black, all black, except for the bloodshot eyes and the red. And yes, the sore on its Right, four paw. That's right, too. Now, the dog is old, certainly a misused one. It always seems to have an erection of a sort. That's right, too. And what else? There's this gray, yellowish, white color when he bears his fangs like this. <laughs> Which he did the day I moved in, the first day I moved in. Now, animals don't take to me like St. Francis had birds hanging off of them all the time. What I mean to say is, animals are indifferent to me. Like people, most of the time. Anyway, from the beginning, this dog wasn't indifferent. He'd snarl and then go after me. Not like he was rabbit. You know, it was sort of a stumbly dog, but it wasn't half that time. It was a good stumbly run. But I almost got away. You see, he did, you know, however, give me my right trouser leg right here. You see where it's meant? He got that the second day I looked there. But I kicked free and I bolted upstairs, so that was that. So this went on for weeks. And thinking about the dog. I made it up in my mind. You know, I decided, first, I'm going to kill the dog with kindness. And if that doesn't work, I'll just kill him. <laughs> no. Yeah, Peter, just listen. So, on the way home, I bought a whole pack of hamburgers. Medium rare, no catsup, no onion. On the way home, I threw away the rolls. All I had was the meat. I made it to the entrance hall. I had the meat. I came in. There he was, waiting for me. It figured. I set the meat down and moved towards the stairs. And I set it down about 12 feet from where the beast was standing. Right so. He looked at me and snarled. <clears throat> Stop. Snarling. Looked back toward the meat. Moved slowly. Then faster. Then faster toward the meat. And when he got there, he looked up at me. I smiled pretendedly. You understand? <laughs> I moved back to the meat. He sniffed. Smelled some more. And then never! He ate it all down all at once as if he'd never eaten anything before in his life but garbage, which might as well be true. I don't think the landlady ever eats anything but garbage. But anyway, <laughs> he ate all the meat all at once. And when he finished, he tried to eat the paper too. And then Peter he looked up at me and smiled. I think 
Thank you, smart. I know Cass did. It was a very gratifying few moments. And then bam! He made after me again. But I made it upstairs safely. I laid up in my room, thinking about the dog. I was offended. I was mad, too. That was six perfectly good hamburgers with not enough pork in them to make it disgusting. I was offended. But I decided I would try again for five more days, but it was always the same. Snarl, <laughs> stop snarling, move towards me, look up at me, smell, <laughs> every single time. Well, by this time, Columbus Avenue was strewn with hamburger rolls, and I was much less offended than disgusted. So, <coughs> I decided to kill the dog. I don't. Keep your arm. I didn't succeed. <laughs> Way home, I bought one hamburger and what I thought was a murderous portion of rat poison. I talked to the man, and I told him, I just want hamburger, one hamburger, don't bother with the rolls. Now, I expected some sort of reaction out of him, like, we don't sell no hands that are eat without the rolls, so what you gonna do, eat with your hands? But no, he smiled benignly, wrapped it in wax paper, and said, a bite for your pussy cat? I wanted to say no. It's for a plot to poison a dog that I know. But can't really say a dog that I know without sounding funny. So I said a little too loud for free, a little too formally. Yes, a fight for my pussy cat. People looked up. It always happens when I simplify things. People look up. It's neither hither nor thither. So on the way home, I pounded together, kneaded the hamburger and the rat poison together between my hands. At this point, feeling as much sadness as disgust. I crept into the entrance hall. There he was, malevolence with an erection, waiting to pounce on me to take an offering. So I set the poison patty down into the table and moved towards the stairs and watched. The beast came up to the meat, devoured it as usual, and smiled, which almost made me sick. And then, bam, he made after me again, but I made it up the stairs as usual. And it came to pass that the beast was deathly ill. I know this because he no longer attended me. Because the leg that he sobered up. She stopped me the day of the murder to confide in me that God had struck her puppy dog a surely fatal blow. She implored me to pray for the end. I wanted to tell her, but madam, I have myself to pray for the Black Queen, the Puerto Rican family, the person who I've never seen, the person who lives below me, the girl who cries deliberately behind her closed door, and all the people in all the rooming houses everywhere. Besides, madam, I don't understand how to pray. But to simplify things, I told her I would pray. She looked up. She said I was a liar, that I probably wanted the dog to die. I told her, and there's so much truth in this, Peter. I told her I didn't want the dog to die. No, I didn't, not just because I poisoned him. I'm afraid I must tell you, I wanted the dog to live so that I could see what our new relationship might come to. Please. Understand, Peter, these sorts of things are important. We have to know the effects of our actions. Anyway, the dog got better. And I have no idea why, unless he was a descendant of the puppy who guarded the gates of hell or some such resort. <laughs> I'm not up to date in my mythology, are you? At any rate, the dog recovered his health, and the landlady, her thirst, in no way altered by the Bow Wow's deliverance. And when I had gotten home from the movie I was watching on 42nd Street, one that was like one or, or several that I'd seen on 42nd Street, after the landlady told me that puppy can get better. You know, I was so hoping for him to be waiting for me. I was enticed, fascinated, you know. I was heart shatteringly anxious. I was it. I was heart shatteringly anxious to confront my doggy friend again. Yes, Peter, friend. I was heart shatteringly etc. to confront my doggy friend again. So when I got home, I made it back to the entrance hall, unafraid to the center, and there he was. You know, he was better. We stared at each other. I don't know for how long, still stone statues just looking at one another. I looked more into his face than he did it. I mean to say, I can look at a dog's face more than a dog can into mine, or anybody's face for that matter. But regardless, for the 20 seconds, or two hours that we stood there looking at each other, we made contact. And this is what I wanted to have happen.
at the now Peter. I love the dog now. And I wanted him to love me. I tried to love him. I tried to kill him. Both had been, un both had been unsuccessful. I thought. You know, I don't really, I don't really know why I expected the dog to understand anything, much less my motivations. I just hoped that the dog would understand. It's just, it's just that if you can't deal with people, you have to make it start somewhere. With animals. You know, don't you see, a person has to have a way of dealing with something, with a bed, a cockroach, a mirror. No, no, that's too hard. That's the final step. With a, a bed, a cockroach, a carpet, a roll of toilet paper. No, that's a mirror too. Oh, it's checker bleeding. Do you see how hard it is to come up with things? With a, a street corner, a wisp of smoke, a wisp of, of smoke with pornographic play cards, with the strong pots, without a lot, with love, with vomiting, with crying, with fury, because pretty little ladies are pretty little ladies, and making money with your body, which is an act of love, and I can prove it, with, with howling, because you're alive, with God. With God, who I'm told turned his back on the whole thing some time ago. You know, someday, with people, people, an idea, a concept, and where better than this humiliating excuse for a jail? You know, where better to, to share one simple, single idea? Where better than in an entrance hall? Where would be a start? You know, where, where better to understand and just possibly be understood? Where better than with a dog? The dog is that. The dog. It seemed like a perfectly reasonable idea. Man is best man, dog's best friend after all. What I saw that day has been the same ever since. We look at each other with a mixture of sadness and suspicion. We feign indifference and then we move on our way. We have tried many forms of contact and they had all failed. The dog has returned to garbage and I, solitary, but free passive. I have not returned. You know, that is to say, I have gained solitary free passage if that much loss can be said to be gained. I have learned that neither kindness nor cruelty, independent of themselves, creates any effect beyond themselves. I've learned that the two together at the same time is the teaching emotion. And what is gained is lost. And what is the result? The dog and I have obtained a compromise, a bargain, really. We neither love nor hurt because we do not try to reach each other. And was me trying to feed the dog an act of love? Was the dog trying to bite me not an act of love? If we can so misunderstand, then why have we created the word love in the first place? The story of Jerry and the dog. The end. Digest for a couple hundred bucks for the most unforgettable character you ever met? Huh? Well, come on, Peter, what do you think? I. <clears throat> I don't think I understand. Why have you told me these things? Why not? I don't understand. That is a No, lie. it's not. No, I tried to explain slowly. <laughs> I went as, I went as I went along. It all has to I don't want to hear anymore. I don't understand. Right. No, it was her dog. 
Oh, what was I thinking? I don't live on your block. I'm not married to two parakeets or whatever your setup is. I'm a permanent transit, and my permanent home is the sickening rest end rooming houses on the west side of New York City, which is the greatest city in the world. Amen. But I'm here. I'm not leaving. Well, you may not be, but I really must be getting going. Come on, just stay with me. No, little. really, I got it. Please, come on, just stay with me. Please stop. What are you doing? Stop. 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 Stop.
fight for it, then. Defend yourself, defend your bench. <laughs> okay, you push me to it. Get up and fight. Like a man? Yes, like a man, if you must insist on mocking me even further. Well, I'll give you one thing, Peter. You are a vegetable. And slightly near something to too. But I'll tell you one thing, Peter. And I meant this. I see this on TV all the time. You have a certain dignity about yourself. It's surprise. Stop! All right, Peter. The battle for the bench. But you know what? We're not even the match. Oh. You are mad! You are stuck with him mad! You're going to kill me? Pick it up. You, pick up the knife, and we'll be more evenly matched. No. Listen, Peter. I'm going to need you to pick up that knife. Let your go. Look me. at me, Peter. Oh, my God! Oh, you had a little vegetable. You couldn't even get your wife with the male child. It was a, it was a matter of genetics, not manhood, you monster! Now, listen to me. I'll give you one last chance. Get out of here and leave me alone. So be it.
That's far. Yeah. Well, but now you're closer. <laughs> and closer. And closer. And closer. And you're even closer now. <laughs>
place where people can stay until they get their feet back on the ground. My brother also trying to get our feet back on the ground our whole lives. Yeah. It takes some people longer to do that than others. Yeah. You guys are loud. What? You in here. You yelling bang? Go right below me. Oh! oh. <laughs> Then, then, yeah, he stops and he keeps out 
after he said that, all I could think about was, because not much of his will makes me feel really good lately or makes much sense anymore. And that kind of scared me because there's got to be something at the stage of the game. There's got to be something that makes you feel really good or at least makes sense. Or what's the point, right? Yeah. But then I kind of came out of feeling sad and I actually felt okay because I realized there is something at the stage of the game. There is one thing that makes me feel really good and that does make sense and it's you. It's always been you. <laughs> Nothing. <laughs> okay, well, I should be heading home to Shiloh, uh, Captain only. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, I'm only going into the mill early tomorrow. Just got some maintenance issues to resolve, but I bet it'll be done by noon. I can pick you up lunch time. Yeah, no. <laughs> I'm gonna the so, so Well, the cracker is going out at church, maybe. You know what, Michelle? I actually forgot. I'm gonna be really busy tomorrow. You know, I gotta be up with the crack and crack to open the salon and do the New Year's wedding tomorrow. I gotta do the bride's hair, and the bridesmaid's hair, and the mom's hair, and all the makeup and the nails. Well, I can pick you up when you're done. Let's like be playing. Yeah, but I might be busy all day. You know, we can do touch-ups for the wedding pictures, and we'll be some skateboarding. We just do stuff at the snowmobile club. I'm probably gonna be really exhausted afterwards. So, so I don't know. <laughs>
does he? <laughs> I am so sorry. I am so embarrassed. Uh, who is this woman and what is she doing here? <laughs> I just honestly thought you'd be here. I always thought you'd be here. Always. Do, do you know this uh, big guy, big strong guy, uh, wrestles heavyweight, always remains strong? Do, do you know him? Play hockey too. Well, I mean, oh, don't don't even answer that. That's just I know that's a horrible question to ask a person who lives in a small town, as if everyone in a small town knows everyone else. Uh, I can't believe this. I don't live here anymore, but when I did, I hated it when people just assumed that I knew everyone in town because it was small. I mean, it was worse than when they asked if there was plumbing way up there, you know. People in small towns really don't know each other any better than people in big towns. You, you know who you know, and you don't know who you don't know, just like anywhere else. I'm sorry. Who was bothering me, but I was. When his parents died, he kept the house. I heard. He lived here. He stayed here. I thought. He was one of the ones who stayed. I didn't say I went away. Most people do. Yeah, I guess he did too. I never thought he would. I guess I lost track. You gotta hang on to those people where you lose them. Wish there was something you could keep them in for when you need them. <laughs> oh, there he is, perfect. <laughs> Boy, it's cold. I forgot. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I can't believe I I took a taxi here from Bangor that's, to see him. That's far. Yeah. <laughs> That's 163 miles. Yeah, this place is a little farther away than I remember. Why did you do that? Well, uh, I can only fly as close as Bangor, and I needed to get to him as fast as I could. Why? To answer a question that he asked. Oh. <laughs> Last time I saw him, he asked me, a very important question, and I didn't answer him, and that's just not a very nice thing to do to a person. Well, that's being a little hard on yourself, don't you think? He asked me to marry him. Oh, and you didn't? I didn't answer him. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's why I'm here, to give him an answer. I mean, I didn't give him an answer in the first place because I didn't have an answer at the time. I mean, I was going off to college, and the night before, I'm about to go off to the world to do what I hope and dream. He asks me, will you marry me? I mean, come on. What was I supposed to do? I was leaving in the morning. I don't know. I mean, I told him. I told him that I'd have to think about it, that I would think about it overnight, and then I'd be back before the sun came up in the morning with an answer, and then I left. I left him standing there, and I didn't make it back in the morning with an answer before the sun came up, or at all. Well, that sounds like an answer to me. No, that wasn't my answer. I, I just I, I went off into the world, and that's not an answer. And I think. What? I think he thought I'd say yes. Well, it's probably not going to ask your girl that question. I, I know. I'm afraid he's been there waiting all night. I just want to let him know now that I know you can't just not answer a question like that to a person, especially to someone you love. You love? Oh, well, I, I don't. We were kids. Yeah. I did. I do. I'm afraid I dashed his hopes and dreams. Oh, come on. You give yourself too much credit. <laughs> he was young. 
That's all you need to get your hopes down. Just be young. Everybody starts out young, so everybody gets their hopes dashed. And besides, I don't think he really dashed his hopes. Because if you dash somebody's hopes, that's kind of a nice way to let them down. Because it hurts, but it's quick. If you would have said no, that would have been dashed his hopes. But you didn't say no. You said nothing. You just didn't answer him at all. And that's kindling hope. A long, slow, painful one because it's still there, just hanging on. That really goes away. And that's like giving somebody a little less air to breathe every day until they die. It's okay, because, you know what, you're early. What? You're early. You said you'd be back with an answer before the sun came up, and geez and crow, the sun's not even close to being up yet. It's only gone down a few hours ago. Look how early you are. That's good of So, a taxi all the way from Bangor. Yeah. To tell me. Honey? Who's Just somebody. Needs directions. Don't wait for directions. Yeah, Suzette, listen. I'll be right in. Okay. I. What? I hope you find the hope. Your place in this world. Goodbye. Bye, Danny. 